All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, depends on where you are on the on the on on the world, uh, anywhere on the world. Uh, so welcome to this uh, first, uh, very first session, paper session of the Spatial Data Science Symposium 2022. And uh, for today, uh, we are going to have four very exciting papers to, to present here. Uh, the first one. Uh, is presented by Anita from the Australia Institute of Technology. And uh, her topic is going to be on the role of spatial data science for federated learning. Uh, Anita, the stage is all yours. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Greetings from Vienna, Austria. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm here with the whole group. Um, so if I don't look straight in the camera, it's because I look at all the other people. So don't feel like it's, it's odd. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to open this uh, first paper session at SCSS uh, number three. And I would like to talk to you about um, the role that spatial data science is supposed to play or can play in the field of federated learning. And uh, after this, this first morning session that we have, I would ask you to um, not just think of this in the sense of applications related to human mobility, um, but also to all kinds of other fields in uh, spatial data science, um, including, of course, mobility of humans, but it might also be other uh, um, phenomena that can be observed and where we can train models and learn more about them. The classical um, federated learning or machine learning architectures, um, quite often we have the case of the different clients, they don't want to share the data, so all they can do is every client trains their own model. So they, they know about a small part of the world, they have a couple of features that they can observe and measure, uh, and they build their own predictive models uh, from that. Sorry to interrupt, Anita, we cannot see your slides anymore. Try to share it again. So in the other cases, I hope you can see the slides again now. Um, in the case where the clients are actually willing and able to share their data, then in such cases we can use centralized learning, which means that the clients and the central server exchange the data and the model is trained on the server. And the server can send back the model to all the clients so that they can profit from each other's data um, in order to get better predictions, better classifications, uh, whatever it is that the machine learning model is supposed to do. What we have in federated learning is that the clients cannot or don't want to share their data with each other, but still they want to profit from having a model that is learned from different data sources. Uh, so what uh, federated learning is all about is uh, uh, having one central orchestrator, one central server, um, and the clients learn um, updates to the model that the central server creates. They send those updates back to the server, they basically uh, send messages of how the model can be improved, the server aggregates those updates together and then it can send out another version of the global model to all the clients that participate in the system. Um, there are a lot of different application fields uh, where this is uh, highly relevant. A classical example that we find in the literature a lot is particularly in health. So this picture is taken from an example there. There was a lot of medical imagery which was collected in different hospitals, but they, of course they don't want to share the patient data or they cannot share patient data with each other because it's highly sensitive. But they can share the, the model updates, they can build a central model that is better than if uh, every hospital, every research group would have only their own data available for the model training. Of course, um, a lot of the other application fields that I stumbled upon were in industry, so where different machines are being observed for fall detection, uh, prevention, uh, predictive maintenance work particularly. Um, my co-authors are currently working in that field, so they did a lot of the uh, research in general about federated learning for me. But when I joined the project, I realized, well, 
Uh, in a lot of cases where federated learning could be relevant because we have actors that cannot share data or they don't want to share data, uh, we also have the fact that um, the data has a spatial component, right? Either the observed phenomena, of their location is relevant, or it could be that the sensors that are observing the phenomena are also, uh, they can be moving, they can be changing location in one way or another, and thus all these, uh, the sensors uh, location could be relevant uh, to, um, could provide relevant information that should be modeled and could enhance the model instead of just treating everything the same as if it didn't matter at all where we made a certain observation. Unfortunately, um, when I when we check machine learning literature, usually it's like, okay, a map is just yet another picture, it has, it has pixels, so we can do whatever we do with pictures. Let's just um, use the hammer that we have and everything looks like a nail. Um, so there's this really um, popular paper on transferring, uh, on going from roadmaps back to um, uh, set uh, aerial images uh, and predicting how it's going to look like um, with general adversary networks. So you reconstruct basically the aerial image from a world image or the other way around. Um, and they throw the, the classical um, image, uh, computer vision uh, algorithms at it and they also published one example amongst many others to, to be honest uh, with this map. But uh, does that mean that these methods are really suitable for spatial data? I, I don't think so. It's, it's a nice um, toy example, but I don't think um, we should let it end there. I think there's more that we can um, provide to this kind of research. Uh, the question is, are we, are we doing that? Uh, certainly there are a lot of machine learning articles and geographic information science journals. Um, so I just looked through, I, I used the search bars in all the journal websites and I looked for machine learning and I also looked for federated learning. There's no restriction in, in the time period of this search. So these are all the papers that have been published in the respective journals. And yeah, machine learning research is really popular, obviously. Federated learning, not so much. Uh, in these journals, I only found one. Um, which is um, on privacy preservation um, for uh, human mobility data, which is great. Um, I also later on when preparing the slides, I found another one, right, which you can see uh, the uh, image on the left is taken from. Uh, that one is actually about uh, federated learning of vehicle trajectories at intersections. Um, so that's a, a horizontal federated learning use case. Um, that means they have um, three different intersections where they could observe the trajectories of the vehicles uh, and they were wanted to classify which ones are um, anomalous, which are dangerous, for example, U-turns or certain uh, heartbreaking maneuvers, all these kinds of stuff. And they do a very good job at describing the different um, architectures that could be possible in a federated learning use case in horizontal federated learning where the idea is that all the, they call it partners, previously I called it clients, uh, all the clients uh, observe the, the same phenomena, the same kind of features, um, but of, of different uh, objects. Um, you could also think of having vertical learning where you have different kind of features that are observed of the same objects, like in the small illustration that I have on the bottom. Uh, all the sensors might be observing the same intersection, but they use different uh, technologies to do so, for example, light or radar and optical. And in the horizontal learning uh, use case, for example, um, they, have, <coughs> they show how it would look like if all the partners, if every partner had data from only one intersection, or if one partner has uh, data from if every partner has a bit of data from all the intersections, how that would influence the quality of the global model that you have built from that. Now, what are some of the, the key challenges in federated learning um, that are already well documented? Um, 
one of the key challenges is certainly that you have to deal with this heterogeneity. You already mentioned uh, on the previous slide, quite often it's the case that the clients have different sized data sets. So one might observe a really large area, for example, and the others might only have spotty local data. Uh, and the question is, how do you weigh that when you aggregate the model in the uh, server, when you receive the, the model updates from the individual client? Um, naturally, the data is also usually not identically dis independently distributed. We all know um, for a spatial data that has a spatial component, we certainly have to account for a spatial and temporal violations of independence. Um, and for a spatial um, <coughs> autocorrelation. So I think that's one point that their spatial data science has a lot of potential to, to contribute to explicitly model um, the, the spatial autocorrelation uh, in this aggregation step when the, client, the updates from the clients uh, are combined into a new version of the model. Um, in, in this graphics you can actually see um, the, the flow that is usually followed. So we, we start out from this um, uh, basic model, the, the initial one that is transmitted to all the clients in the second step. Then in the first step all the nodes they update the, the local model with their data and then uh, in the fourth step that's where it gets really interesting like make the decision on how to aggregate the data. The basic approach is that federated average is really as stupid as it sounds. It just calculates the average of all the, the model updates. But there are multiple variations, and I think there should be also ones that take the spatial information into account uh, in this aggregation step. Um, so the potential here that I see, and I, I would love uh, if you can already point me to some existing work about that, I, which I did not find so far. Um, the spatial data science could help improve fairness in a sense that the model performs uh, equally well in different parts of the observation area where it's valid and, not, uh, and it does not overvalue one area where we have one client that collects a lot of uh, data um, and it's um, Underperforms in an area where we don't have uh, that many clients collecting data, for example, as would be the case if we just average everything up. I also think that uh, special data science could help with regards to explainability. Um, so there are cases where the model might, the central model might drift towards uh, a certain local model um, because of the aggregation choices that we make. Um, so knowing like what are the spatial characteristics of the this local model and all the other uh, information might help in explaining why this helps and how we could avoid it. And I also think that the in performance could be potentially improved by having this additional knowledge <coughs> in, the, in the model. Uh, another thing that we may consider for spatial data science and collaborative learning is um, improving performance through client-side model personalization. Here the idea is that not every of the clients, when they get the central model back and they, they use it, they don't necessarily need to use it as is. They can customize it with some local information, some of their local knowledge that they, know, that they have. Um, and in this local knowledge, I think uh, spatial information can also play a large role um, so the idea is that we have geographically aware personalization settings. Like if I have a model that can predict, um, I don't know, travel time, I'm thinking of something stupid here right now, um, or make suggestions for locations, it might give different suggestions or might evaluate different options, whether I'm on the countryside or whether I'm in the city. Um, in, in the context of, uh, so I can even change my location and that changes how my client side model personalization works. One more minute, Anita. Yes, um, the, on the privacy side, um, the federated learning challenges about the privacy, so sharing all updates can still risk 
revealing sensitive information. Uh, so there we might want to leverage also already existing methods for privacy preservation, um, like privacy preservation uh, on the right hand side, I have this privacy preserving heat map example. Um, but on, on all the levels of the models, basically, um, there could be um, the need for methods that protect us a sensitive spatial temporal data. And uh, last but not least, one of the federated learning challenges that uh, is particularly noticeable um, in industry settings and in transportation settings is the communication bottlenecks. So if you have mobile clients, they might lose connection, like this of the program I tried to present, uh, and there might be bandwidth fluctuations. So knowing where the client is and when they might lose connection because they're moving out of the area with good coverage might also help in performance of the model. Um, last but not least, um, usually federated learning approaches assume that the client has labeled data. Um, quite often in special data science, this is not the case. Um, so we need other ways of how to deal with it, how to add labels, the help of human annotators, active learning, for example, which requires then appropriate visualization so that humans can actually do the labeling task. And that's where I think we need appropriate geo visualization tools that actually enable the human annotators to do the labeling task. So, really, um, what I would love to discuss later on, if we have the time, is um, how can uh, GI science. Um, influence what's going on in better rate of learning, how can we show that um, our contributions are valuable, um, and there's other areas, of course, which I didn't touch upon, like legal and business issues right now, um, but I'm really looking forward to the discussion in this domain, and I want to thank you for this opportunity. All right, thank you very much, uh, uh, very interesting topic. All right, uh, now let's move on to our next speaker, Jessica. And Jessica is from the Oak Ridge National Lab. And here I also want to highlight that right now it is probably the midnight for Jessica. So we really appreciate you can join us uh, at a, such a late, late time. Um, Jessica's talk gonna be about the improving the land scan USA non-obligate population estimate. Uh, Jessica, the stage is all yours. Hi, um, well, I, <clears throat> I guess good afternoon to many of you. Um, it is actually uh, 6.35 in the morning for me. So uh, kind of a, an interesting um, meta situation, I guess, for um, for the uh, the talk I'm gonna give. So um, uh, I'm, I'm talking about um, some of the digital trace data that we have uh, for, um, for use in in LandScan USA. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what that is. A lot of you I know are not um, US based. Um, and at Oak Ridge, uh, yeah, I, I have worked there for about 10 years. We do a lot of um, work with um, federal government. Uh, we're we're a federal, federal government organizations. So we have a lot of, um, you know, federal government level um, sponsors who require data uh, at scale. So that's kind of always central to uh, to the work that I've done is, is uh, oh, I, I guess I should say that Krista Brelsford is the lead author on this, um, but but we've worked uh, very closely in, in um, implementing, uh, you know, some different new data techniques uh, into this baseline data population that we that we've been working on. So I've been working on this uh, model uh, for Landscan USA for, for a decade or so. It's been really cool to see in that time uh, just how much uh, data has changed. I think that that, that um, is a cool thing, you know, based on the previous conversations, you know, how, how do we use data that's two years old? Can we, can we use that? Um, and it's been really interesting to see how that's changed. Um, and, you know, we, we went from not having satellite imagery everywhere to now that's, you know, a given. And um, so, um, but really the focus today is on a, a very tiny slice of our model. Uh, so we have um, a baseline population. So a nighttime is incarcerated people and then residential people. And that's gonna be workers and adults, students and kids, 
and we're getting these different data sources from uh, you know, the federal government has um, efforts to uh, keep like points of interest. That's what this high field HIFLD data is. So it's point locations of like prisoners uh, of prison locations, school locations, um, and other types of um, you know emergency response types of uh, geospatial data available there. So um, so that is is the data uh, sets that we have. And then the American Community Survey is a population uh, from our census. Um, and then we have a census BLS hybrid product that tells us where, um, where workers are uh, in their workplaces as well as workers in their home location. So, hey, we have, you know, X number of workers coming from this county, for example. Uh, and we use those different sources to get a full picture of where people are at night and also where they are during the day. Um, but there's a, uh, a sliver of people, you know, we can say workers are at their workplace location and we also can say, okay, let's take them out of their nighttime location when they're uh, at work, when we're putting them in their workplace. Uh, and the same thing with students in, in daycare children. We can we can make that switch. Okay, we can identify those those two components uh, at their residential location, so we know where to take them out of, and uh, also where to put them in. Uh, but then there is another sliver uh, that's the non-obligate uh, population that that we're trying to estimate. That's everybody else. Where are they? So you know, when you take everybody, and there's workers, and then there are people that aren't working. So in the U.S., there are 330 million people or so, uh, and then for the work, worker number, we have uh, about 141 million people. Uh, there are 50, some, 50 or so million uh, K-12 students. So, so there's still a lot of people who are not accounted for in these uh, precise defined spatial locations. So uh, our question here is, where do people go when they have nowhere to be? Um, and that's, uh, there, there aren't good quality national scale statistics on this. Um, you know, where are people going to spend that leisure time? Uh, and I, um, we're also at about the time that my children wake up, so they, they might show up. So, um, just to, to warn you all. Um, so we have census data worker locations, uh, and then we have this, uh, newer data sets. This is one of the ones that, that is, uh, available to us or has been available, um, and it's called uh, Safe Graph Foot Traffic Data. I don't know if, uh, if you all are familiar with that, but um, it's digital trace data. It comes from cell phones. Um, and we have, um, you know, this, we first started working with this data during the COVID-19 pandemic because we have this baseline assumption of people go where their activity space is. Uh, and that pandemic really shakes that foundation of, you know, activities happen at a particular place for that activity. Um, and that's when we started using this data set. So, but we still have to have that baseline. Uh, and we're, we're trying to figure out that sliver of non-obligate. Uh, and the first thing we needed to do is, is see if we could tease out um, workers from the, the safe graph data. So the safe graph data should be encompassing uh, most people in uh, public spaces. So, you know, when you're at work, you're in public generally. Um, so, so that's really what we're trying to, to carve out of that data set. Um, and, you know, there, this is the type of data where it's, it has biases, um, you know, representation issues and, and those things that, um, you know, we're very concerned about, uh, especially like how does that vary spatially? So we really have to interrogate that data to see um, how well we can do uh, with that. Uh, answering. So this is, uh, you know, you can look this data set up and, um, and find, find more information about it. So um, hold on just a second. Well, and my daughters are, are awake now. So uh, it's a fun morning. Um, so our uh, um, 
All right, they uh, woke up together. This is nice. So anyway, the uh, the long visits. Uh, so there's a concept in the in the safe graph data that has visit duration. So how long are, are people at these places? And this is really good data for you know they're selling it to businesses right. for the most part. And um, and the long. Hold on. Let me <laughs> All right, let's give Jessica a little bit of time um, to settle down the kids. All right, they're, uh, they're dynamic little humans. So, um, so what we have is a short visit uh, and long visits. And we decided that, um, let's see how good the, the long visits are as a proxy for workers. Uh, and then maybe we can, say these other people are non-obligate people. Um, so then we can use that ratio to improve our models. Okay, so this is our uh, initial analysis and there's uh, more information in, and we have a nature scientific data paper about this ratio that really goes into the detail. Uh, so I won't go into it too much here, but, but we found that it is a pretty good proxy um, and there are spatial variations to that. Uh, I think the point level here is like a census block group. So that's, um, there are about 200,000 of those units in the U.S. Um, it's a modifiable aerial unit that, that has its issues, but, but broadly speaking, um, we were seeing a pretty good relationship between those long visitors and workers. So, um, we were also wanted to see how this, uh, you know, how good is it at, as you scale it? So obviously as you aggregate that out to counties, so there are about 3,000 of those in the U.S., there are 70 or 80,000 tracks. Um, so as you, as you aggregate up, you know, hitting that uh, one here means that there's no bias. Um, so the closer you get to that county level, the better that number is at, as, at relating to workers. Um, but then uh, there wasn't much variability uh, across the, the different urban classes there. So um, now we'll get into uh, a little bit more of that ratio uh, and how we're trying to use it in our context of the US uh, and across the whole US. Uh, Cause that's kind of, you know, that national scale needing to apply it at all of the, the smaller units is, uh, is a pretty, um, interesting problem. So this is the state of Tennessee. And um, one of the, the things that I think you'll, you'll, the biggest takeaway here is, you know, there's a lot of variety, uh, that spatial variance in this uh, long to short visit ratio. Um, so these are Nashville, these are the three biggest cities in, in the state. Um, and Memphis is a big transportation hub. Uh, Federal Express, you know, FedEx, the shipper is is um, based there. Uh, Nashville is, you know, all of these though have kind of a downtown core, but you can see by the smaller units and then more suburban areas. Um, and we can see that, uh, you know, a lot of times those core areas are where there are mostly workers, not, not a lot of shoppers in the U.S. at least. And then we have a lot of uh, shopping places that are that are in these suburb suburb type areas. Um, so we have more of those non-obligate visitors in the suburbs and fewer, fewer in rural places. So this is one of uh, the bigger revelations that we have, um, you know, kind of something that we know. But then being able to, you know, bring that to bear is, uh, is an important thing. The, um, they're back. Good job. Thank you. All right. Um, so, you know, how many people are, are leaving those rural areas and coming into, uh, into urban areas is, is something that's particularly hard to, to model and measure. So, um, um, so model one, can you get that? 
to work, please? Come on. Um, so we're going to try to ignore them. Uh, yeah, no, I gave you my phone to use, though. Um, so the model one here is our non-obligate uh, allocation kind of a as usual. So what we did here was uh, used a, a time use survey and carved off 11. Uh, we carved off 11 uh, percent of the population. And that's kind of uh, our estimate of how many people are doing that uh, or are in that non-obligate. Um, so in this map, we distributed them back to their county. This is the way we've been distributing that population, um, you know, for the last decade or so. Uh, in this next step, what we did is say, hey, let's just expand out um, and allocate those folks to their entire metro area, which seems kind of a, an obvious step, I think. It's, you know, it's pretty intuitive to think that people in rural areas are coming into those metro areas. Um, but uh, we're, we're actually able to uh, study that and bear it out a little bit more now with, with the new data sets. So, and then in model three is where we took that long short visit ratio and applied that uh, to help uh, on the finer grain scale say, let's allocate uh, more shoppers uh, or non-obligate people uh, to workers uh, where there where there is a, a higher ratio there. Um, so these maps focus on that uh, model two change. So here, um, and this is the Knoxville metro area. So you can see the the county lines, and then there's a, a bigger metro area here. <coughs> Bless you. Uh, and then those um, you can see that the darker colors here mean. Uh, people are coming into that more populated area and they're coming in from a lot of these more rural areas. Um, and then uh, this this spot right here in the middle is actually where Oak Ridge National Laboratory is. So there's a, a lot of workers and not really a lot of non, non workers coming to that space. So um, that's something that when we look at uh, model three, it really sticks out that we're able to put those people who are not uh, visitors to our laboratory, um, you know, back out into uh, places like uh, grocery stores. And that's this blue area that you see, he see here is a big shopping area. So um, so really what, what we're seeing here, the big takeaway is that yes, we can use this, uh, this digital trace data um, to help us put more people in uh, retail and leisure locations uh, and in the urban cores and um, out and take them out of the industrial locations and, and the suburbs. Uh, so when we have this carefully validated data, which you know we went to went through quite a bit uh, of a validation on that, uh, we can um, can use that data to improve our, our baseline models. So uh, um, all right. Uh, apologies for all of the interruptions, um, but and, and thank you all for your uh, for your time. Thanks a lot, Jessica. Uh, no worries. Uh, yeah, we are appreciate again you are you are you are joining us at such an early time and great to see kids. All right. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, by the way, we are gonna save all the questions at the end. Uh, so uh, please stay around. So our next speak, uh, speaker is Hao Jing, and she's from the University of Calgary. And again, thanks a lot, uh, Hao Jing. Uh, she's right now probably also in the midnight or early morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Hao Jing, do you want to start sharing your screen? Yes, please. Yeah, try it first. Yeah. All right, uh, Hao Jing, you can start. OK. Uh, hi everyone, uh, it is almost 5 a.m. here, as you said, quite early, but being here and hearing these talks and valuable multidisciplinary points of view is really enjoyable. Uh, my name is Hajin, a master's student in geography at University of Calgary. Today, I'm here to talk about the research I'm conducting under the supervision of Dr. Victoria Fast, who is also here today. She is an associate professor at the Department of Geography of University of Calgary. 
Combining our expertise, Dr. Fest as an accessibility mapping expert and me with a background in urban planning and design, we try to promote more urban accessibility for diverse mobilities with the help of geospatial artificial intelligence. Uh, I must know that this research is funded by SHRC and New Frontier organizations based in Canada, but it is not a product of them. Please go to the next slide. Uh, let me see. <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay, I think that I already shared it, I think. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. It was finally shared. Uh, to create more inclusive cities, uh, the accessible built environment for people with disabilities has been investigated within special data science research. Also, the number of studies employing semi-automated and automated data-driven methods for the built environment accessibility assessment is growing. This subject was well addressed in SDSS 2021 in the session, The Future of Global Scale Spatial Data Collection and Analysis on Urban Inaccessibility, Accessibility for People with Disabilities. Uh, in the session, the latest methods for measuring sidewalks quality, condition, and accessibility were discussed with the focus on people with disabilities. Uh, in this regard, research on accessible built environments for people with disabilities within the spatial data science literature has largely focused on sidewalk assessment. These studies have explored the sidewalk condition for those with limited movement abilities, mainly through identifying sidewalks material, connectivity, wayfinding features, aids and barriers. Building on this significant work that has been done in uh, sidewalk assessment research, uh, we want to consider the accessibility of public uh, urban spaces uh, as well. Urban places are vital for vibrant city life since they act as mobility features in form of uh, urban streets or destinations themselves, like urban squares and parks. Uh, and during our daily life, we interact closely with these places. However, Urban places can restrict the full participation of people with disabilities. People with disabilities are those persons with uh, permanent, temporary, or uh, disabilities, uh, evident or not. Uh, in fact, the way the urban environment is planned, designed, and managed determines whether or not uh, people with disabilities are welcome in urban places. This is a demonstration of social model of disability itself, uh, which defines disability as an experience of discrimination resulting from inaccessible built environment rather than physical impairment. So making places accessible is important since uh, they have the capacity to influence people's feelings, uh, a process that results in creating the sense of place. And for a sense of place to be created, there is a need for a long and deep experience of the place and preferably involvement in the place. This means that the users not only reach a place, the common understanding of accessibility, but be welcome to spend time in that place. Just as Dr. Stephen Winter will mention in session one, it is important to create more accessibility in our cities rather than mobility. So it can be said that a place that is accessible is not only reachable as a mobility feature, but also usable in all its features. For example, accessible sidewalks to be used to reach the place, accessible benches to be used to sit on, or accessible street lights to be used to feel safe at uh, dark hours. In our study, an important factor in creating urban places is the scale of inquiry. So focusing on urban places like urban streets and squares, we are most con concerned with the street scale. Uh, that's because it is at the street scale that we interact closely with the urban environment uh, during our, daily, uh, our everyday life, and our choice to use the place is affected by its welcoming or unwelcoming features. 
Inclusive design and accessibility research concentrates largely on accessibility for disabled people, and so much great work has been done on physical disabilities, especially movement disabilities, in order to make the built environment more inclusive for these people. Building on this important work as well, we aim to create even more inclusive urban environments by including the equity deserving groups. Equity deserving groups are those with differing and intersectional physical abilities and identities, including women, seniors, children, LGBTQs, and neurodiverse. Accessible urban places for equity deserving groups can be understood as a public space for all where everyone feels welcomed, included, and not discriminated against by their personal differences when being in that space. So we believe that to improve the physical accessibility of urban places at the street scale for including equity deserving groups, there is a need to represent model and simulate street scale accessible features. Street scale accessible features are the physical elements at the street scale that make the urban places reachable and usable for all. I can discuss some examples of street scale accessible features here. For example, features of the place that are flexible, like movable streets furniture, or integrated pavement with minimum ups and downs that overcomes these uh, ups and downs through sloping for supporting those with different movement abilities. Another example can be multi-sensory features that promote, for example, smell, touch, sound, and taste senses, in addition to vision, because of course, vision is not our only sense. These features support deafness and blindness most of all. For example, using multi-sensory design in designing wayfinding features. Uh, another example here can be features supporting privacy. Some groups like LGBTQ groups need some level of, level of privacy to feel free and safe in the place. And this can be provided through these features like greenery and lightning and benches to break up space and sidelines and provide more privacy. So we need to collect data on these street scale accessible features to analyze, map, and measure them for the assessment of urban place accessibility condition. However, we lack complete data on street scale features. And too often we use roads as a proxy for these types of analysis that lack sufficient details at the street scale. So the biggest challenge we see moving forward to assessing and improving the accessibility of urban places is filling this data gap. And this is where we can make an effort to integrate spatial data science into social urban design science as well, as emphasized in session one. Mainly there are two available uh, data collection and analysis approaches for accessibility mapping. In the first approach, data collection and analysis on the built environment are conducted via in-person street audits and manual data processing. But this method has been proved to be labor intensive, costly, and error prone. In the second approach as automated or semi-automated methods, data collection is mainly based on crowdsourcing methods with the help of platforms like design mobile apps, Google Street View data, or corresponding digital uh, map visualizations. Uh, for this, uh, for semi-automated and automated accessibility mapping, three main types of data are available. Uh, some study approaches largely rely on um, online digital maps like Google Maps and OpenStreetMap, which despite their significant progress, still lack complete detail of street scale features. Some other studies have used high resolution remotely sensed data like uh, aerial imagery to extract sidewalks and their condition. Uh, of course, using AI, uh, AI capabilities. However, street scale features are likely to be blocked by overhead obstacles like building shadows or foliage of trees. Uh, as you can see in the middle picture, that's some important part of the uh, urban places are hidden by the shadow of the buildings. Uh, 
Street scale features are best identified from an on-ground pedestrian point of view. Uh, but Google Street View images, uh, which are from an on-ground perspective, miss spaces between road networks, such as urban parks and urban places, as you can see uh, in the right picture. Uh, so these data types provide rich information about the built environment that can act as our main structured data. However, for the details at the street level, we can act that can act as uh, our minor structure data, we will use uh, ground-based mobile LiDAR data. LiDAR scanners can quickly collect 3D information by producing dense and unorganized points that uh, require further processing to identify the ground features. So the main reason for using LiDAR data itself is that it offers positional and 3D information and scaled models of the object, which is more appropriate for mapping and measuring street scale accessible features. But uh, with LiDAR scanners, it is not always possible to fully capture the object in question because of the occlusion of target objects. And this restriction is magnified in aerial LiDAR, LiDAR systems. As you can see in the left picture uh, that uh, here, uh, that the aerial LiDAR data does not cover street scale features like benches. But here, mobile LiDAR systems provide the possibility of collecting data in high detail. As the right picture here shows, uh, a part of, and actually it shows a part of our collected LiDAR data using iPhone 13 Pro Max LiDAR scanner. Street scale features like benches, street light footprints, and bollards are observable. As a disadvantage of LiDAR data, it contains less semantic information compared with imagery. Uh, however, deep learning techniques, fortunately, allow the extraction of semantic information from LiDAR data. Uh, semantic segmentation technique seems more relevant to our research goal among all deep learning techniques that uh, are available uh, for working with point clouds uh, and has been applied in different studies at scales comparable to our study. So semantic segmentation is the process of classifying point clouds into multiple homogeneous regions and the points in the same region will have the same properties. As can be seen in this left picture, the points representing a real entity have been classified as a specific class like chair class or roof class or table class. Uh, in our research, as you can see here, using semantic segmentation models, each point of LiDAR data can be assigned to a street scale accessible feature class, like a street light, as you can see in this picture. As an urban designer and geography experts, rather than professional programmers, we will utilize the ISRI platform that makes available a range of deep learning and automated uh, automation tools that were previously unavailable to us. ArcGIS API for Python includes different modules, and one of the useful modules for our work is ArcGIS.Learn. This module allows training semantic segmentation technique to detect and classify street scale accessible features from our collected LiDAR data. Uh, actually, Esri platforms uh, provide limited uh, models for work, uh, mod deep learning models for working with point clouds, but instead it provides a rich environment to integrate the LiDAR data with other data types and uh, to detect, classify, uh, and map street scale accessible features using deep learning models. And it allows us to store, manage, and present our data in various forms. Uh, well, our work puts forward a vision for cities that are more inclusive for all equity deserving group members by, by creating urban places that are accessible in all uh, their uh, physical features. Uh, we emphasize the significance of the street scale of these places for diverse mobilities and uh, explore the combination of on-ground mobile LiDAR data and ESRI's API. Uh, AI capabilities to fill the data gap at the street scale of urban places. 
And this was an attempt to integrate spatial data science into other multidisciplinary fields to answer more human-based needs. Here, we try to extend the accessible mapping conversation from SDSS 2021 to include our urban design perspective. This is not the end of this conversation though. The future of accessible cities demands more constructive dialogues between experts from both academia and industry with diverse points of view. And as society is diverse and as barriers to accessibility are multifaceted, we strongly believe that expanding multidisciplinary conversations is the key to more inclusive accessible communities. Thank you. Thanks, Hao Jing. Very inspiring talk here. All right, uh, let's next move on to our next speaker, Joa. And he's going to present us the paper about towards natural language interfaces for interacting with remote sensing data. And Java, you can share your uh, share your screen and start your talk. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, okay. So hello, everyone. I'm João. I'm a PhD student at the University of Lisbon under the supervision of uh, Bruno Martins. And this is our vision paper, uh, Towards Natural Language Interfaces for Interacting with Remote Sensing Data. So uh, the test I'll be talking about are visual question answering and image captioning, which are very exciting problems. They uh, bridge methods from areas such as computer vision and uh, natural language processing. Uh, we argue that these tasks constitute a useful framework to interact with earth observation data. So uh, we can have text descriptions of images or we can ask for specific information in an image. Uh, image uh, captioning uh, consists on having a, a, an aerial image fitted to a model that provides a textual description of the image. Uh, in visual question answering, we have uh, the aerial image, uh, a question, and the model tries to obtain an answer that is relevant uh, regarding the context of the image. Uh, examples of such questions can be how many residential buildings are there in the image, or are there water bodies next to agricultural, agricultural areas in the image? So there has been a growing interest in the application of deep learning methods in the remote sensing domain. Uh, including the application of vision and language models. However, uh, we found that some limitations uh, in this area. There are some possible avenues to explore. So there are new uh, deep learning methods that have not yet been used that have shown good results in uh, many different tasks, such as the transformer architecture. And uh, usually these models are evaluated on small data sets build automatically and without much diversity, both in questions uh, and in uh, geographical areas. So we argue that to truly really become a, a more general purpose, these models should be trained uh, with more amounts of data uh, from both different geographical areas and at the same time aiming, from, uh, aiming for different thematic objectives. So our vision paper surveys the state of the art uh, in terms of models supporting natural language interfaces for interacting with remote sensing data and also discuss open challenges. So regarding remote sensing image captioning, most methods are based on encoder-decoder approaches. So firstly, an image is fed to a convolutional neural network, which is able to obtain uh, feature maps that are representation of the image. Then these uh, representation is fed to a recurrent neural network that uh, generates a caption word by word at each time using neural attention to aim the parts of the, the visual input that are relevant for the current prediction. Uh, in this area, there is a, a lot of work and most previous work focused on the improvement of the attention mechanism, taking into account specific characteristics of the remote sensing data. 
such as the scale variance of the, the images. Uh, some examples of remote sensing image caption data sets are the RISICD and the newly created NWPU captions. Uh, regarding remote sensing, visual question answering. Uh, usually, uh, the image is also fed to a convolution neural network to obtain a representation for the image. Then the question is fed to a recurrent neural network to obtain a representation for the question. These features are aggregated in a fusion model. And then uh, this uh, uh, fused representation is fed to a classifier that obtains an answer. So usually uh, visual question answering is treated as a classification task. An example data set is the remote sensing VQA. Uh, usually the question types of, uh, of this task are usually about object counting, relative positioning between objects of interest, and scene classification. So uh, towards larger models with more data. Uh, apart from recent st studies, uh, researchers have not yet explored uh, recent transformer architectures. Uh, for example, there is this uh, CLIP uh, model, which was trained on uh, many pairs of uh, many pairs of images and, and captions. And what it does is that it uh, uh, embeds uh, the image, embeds uh, the, the image caption. And then it's trained such that the representations of these, uh, of both of these, are are near in the same embedding space. So there, there is this work by by Bayesian and colleagues that uh, use these uh, clip uh, image and question encoders and only trained the fusion mechanism, which consisted of a, a co-attention mechanism to attend both uh, image and uh, question features. Uh, there's also this interesting CLIP RS-ICD model, uh, which was uh, fine to, to, to the remote sensing domain. And what it can do is that we can give a textual description of a, a, an image, and it obtains uh, the most similar images to that caption. Uh, however, we argue that these models were fine to with uh, uh, little amounts uh, of data, and uh, usually uh, the data sets were also no, didn't take into account the, di the diversity of uh, possibilities. Uh, there are also other pre-training objectives that uh, are being developed that can also be considered for these type of models. Uh, one interesting limitation that we found is that uh, the input size of the image. So even though the question can, uh, the model can be about uh, uh, high resolution images with uh, a lot of detail or low resolution images uh, with a bro uh, representing a broader area, the models are usually fed images of size 2200 by 2200 uh, uh, pixels. Uh, and uh, what is found is that these models can achieve uh, already good results uh, even uh, having this small size of input image. So it will be interesting to study uh, the application of transformers that uh, are able to uh, be fed input images of larger input size, or just by consider uh, having an image divided into more multiple patches. So uh, regarding models that are right for the right reasons, uh, models usually rely on spuracy correlations and bias from data instead of sticking to facts. So they uh, do uh, correlations between irrelevant objects, for example, uh, and uh, to try to obtain the answers. Uh, one interesting finding as well is that uh, some visual question answering models can obtain good results just by analyzing common patterns in the questions and the proportions of the answers in the, the answer space. So for this, uh, we argue that we could introduce diversity in the data uh, for better model training uh, by leveraging resources like the OpenStreetMap. So for this, we can build new intel questions that should produce a consistent answer. 
we can also uh, introduce counterfactual questions where so the images are uh, blurred or are edited and the model should not uh, obtain an, uh, the same answer as before with the original image. And there's also uh, an interesting approach that is to edit uh, images semantically. So for example, we, we remove an irre irre irrelevant object from a scene. We should ensure that the same question answer parallels. Uh, another uh, interesting approach is to improve the localization abilities of these vision and language models for remote sensing. So uh, besides producing the right answer, uh, models should also correctly point in the image regions that can support and justify the results. Uh, some interesting findings in these uh, vision transformers that are trained in a self-supervised manner is that their feature maps the representations of the image are sh have been shown to contain explicit information about semantic object boundaries, which can be leveraged. Um, another approach is uh, have a multitask learning uh, approach for model training. So the model is trained for the main task, either image captioning or visual question answering, and should uh, also uh, optimize the generation of segment semantic segmentation masks. Uh, for this, OpenStreetMap is a useful resource that can be useful to uh, augment the, the existing data sets with the segmentation masks. Uh, towards open domain and conversational models. So, as I said, um, most methods treat visual question answering as a classification task. Uh, it is a, a too artificial uh, way of uh, dealing with this task. Uh, methods should move to an open setting uh, to generate an answer word by word, uh, at the same time combining visual question answering and image captioning. Some possible step forwards are to merge together the data sets from each uh, task. And uh, when we have image caption, we can treat uh, the, image, the, the, the image as the image input the caption as a possible answer, and we can have just a generic question asking what is being shown here. We can also have more, uh, generate more interesting questions. There are these uh, methods that, uh, given an answer and uh, a caption of an image, try to generate uh, a textual uh, question that can be answered by, by, by that answer and caption. Uh, and for this, we can also leverage uh, tools like OpenStreetMap to create or augment existing data sets. Uh, one interesting uh, uh, topic as well is to consider conversational approach where the users are interacting uh, with the system and the questions or prompts are given in the context of a dialogue. So uh, to conclude, uh, our vision paper reviews uh, some of the existing vision and language methods dealing with remote sensing data. We discuss open challenges and possible developments, uh, training with uh, uh, larger uh, models with more data to introduce more diversity and uh, also consider uh, larger input images. Uh, we, we also focus on improving model robustness uh, by treating uh, the task as a multitask uh, objective, having the models a main task of visual question answering or image caching and generation of semantic masks. And finally, we argue that uh, we should move from close to into open settings in which the answers are uh, generated by text and the outputs are less restricted. So uh, please contact us if you are interested in discussing further, further or would like any other information and uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Joe. Very nice talk. Uh, now, uh, our, our four presenters have finished their talks. Now uh, let's move on to our QA session. So um, you can either post your questions into the QA tab uh, on your left side of the panel, or you can directly raise your hands and then I will bring you to the stage to directly interact with the speakers. Uh, so far in the QA tab, we already had 
many uh, questions, so I will go through them uh, in the order uh, of showing on my screen here. Uh, so the first one, I'm going to show it on the screen, uh, is from Yano. Uh, the question is, uh, is towards to Anita, and uh, his question is, I'm still not 100% sure whether I buy into the fairness argument. Don't your slides also show that this is more about issues of aggregation, pooling, and et cetera? So, Nita, uh, this is your question. Right, I hope you can hear me. Since Jan is in the same room, that's, that's great as well. And um, I agree, it depends a lot on the, your definition of fairness, of course. Um, so, the, the, the fairness that was described in these general um, federated learning papers was about whether um, the, the global models model performs equally well for each of the participating clients. And I think uh, it's not just about whether it performs uh, well for all of the clients, it's also a question of whether it performs well in different regions. Um, and of course it's a question of how you aggregate the model at the central server. But if you use the default approaches, it will certainly not be fair. Um, but this way, at least, we, we have a lead on how to make it fairer from the geographical perspective, from the spatial perspective as well. If I may reply directly, and I hope everybody else can hear that, but that seems to be more of an argument, which I think I'm 100% in line with you, but an argument for spatial heterogeneity in machine learning models that are otherwise trained on spatial dependency, right? So you could equally well represent or try to address this in, say, the pooling stage, right? I don't think that it's federation per se that makes this happen. And then you showed, and I think that was a really nice talk and a great example, the aggregation, you even said, well, that's bogus, right? And exactly, you would have the very same happening, so the lack of fairness, if you would just aggregate over your federation, right? All right, do you understand correctly if you say pooling, that's the, the selection of the clients that get to participate? Oh, no, in, in pooling in like non-federated. Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, absolutely, I'm not sure whether we can really solve the problem, but I think it would be worthwhile to, to try and to address it and to show in which cases it would work or not. Uh, a lot of the issues that I raised today is more like, uh, have you even tried it yet? Uh, let me know if you know someone who has tried it already and didn't publish it because it didn't work. <laughs> um, because what we are going to look into in the future in the project that I uh, alluded to in the Outlook, um, uh, we currently have a centralized model for anomaly detection and maritime movement. Um, and we want to make that into a federated model. And so really I'm trying to find out all the bits and pieces, what people have already done, which we could build upon um, to, to make this happen. Fantastic, great job, thank you. All right, so it's glad that I'm glad that you guys are actually gathered in Vienna. Maybe you can have more offline discussion along this track uh, in Vienna. So uh, we have many questions in the QA session. I'm not going to go through them one by one because due to the time limit, I'm going to pick some ones here. Uh, the next question is to Jessica. Um, this, I think this question is also relevant to the one um, Anita and Yano was just discussed. It's more about, you know, we use the data from the CIF, uh, CIF graph or other digital trace data and can comment on the accessibility or availability or coverage of this data and while this data spares uh, further impact the model spares or end, end product spares. Thanks. Hi, yes. Um... So we uh, used SafeGraph data that became available during the COVID-19 pandemic. So in you know, early 2020, we started using this data. Uh, and then every, um, and it was available freely for, uh, for all COVID-19 related modeling, regardless of who it was. Um, they have a program for academics. I put a link in the chat uh, for that. Um, so if you got an academic based justification for, for using it, they give you some credits for that. Um, yeah, so, you know, we, we were getting this data first. It's, it's very much a, a biased data set. You know, what, what points of interest do they have? Are they capturing that? Are they assigning people to, um, and that's something that we tried to, well, first off, they're improving that data set underneath all the time, uh, and in, 
Yeah, I think they release monthly updates and then they will retroactively update their historical, you know, their previous data as well. Um, so that's, you know, the data is kind of move, moving underneath you um, as, you know, but you can update your models uh, as they've added more places. Uh, and that that that's helpful for some of the like specific category based, you know, if you're trying to do restaurants. Um, and then another, like one of the strategies we used was to just aggregate out to like the block group uh, or the tract and get, you know, that helps, you know, that that duration is, is what we used it for. So, so it's really good for that duration. Uh, it gets less good, uh, you know, the finer you try to chop that up into restaurant visits and, and things like that. I'm not sure uh, how much uh, of their data is available internationally. Uh, it's, it's available for U.S., uh, Canada, um, and some U.S. territories. Um, so that's, you know, I haven't used it directly in, in a little while, um, but, but that's, that's the information I have about it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting data set and we were, we were excited to, to see how it could help, help us model, yeah. uh, human movements. So. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Jessica. Um, next question, um, goes to Hao Jing. Uh, do you have experience in how the detection of features could be used for other purpose, purposes as well? Uh, for example, like to, to detect obstacles for visually impaired person or people with movement disabilities. Uh, what are their requirements? Uh, uh, a great question. A great question. Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a very good question, and actually it is the expertise of my supervisor, Dr. Victoria Fast. Uh, uh, I can uh, discuss an example here. For example, we can detect uh, TikTok uh, uh, strips that support those uh, who are visually impaired, for example, or pathway widths or obstacles or, and barriers for people with movement disabilities. Uh, but uh, to map all of these features, uh, we need high resolution data and they are not uh, they are often not scalable so they are very costly and difficult to get uh, so uh, some of the uh, projects have used uh, a combination of crowdsourcing and ai capabilities and a good example here is the project sidewalk uh, which has a uh, used aerial imagery uh, to uh, detect sidewalk networks and its materials. And uh, also it, use, uh, it has used across source data to detect obstacles through uh, Google uh, Street View images. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think uh, because there are so, uh, these uh, mapping these features uh, needs centimeter resolutions. There are often uh, difficult to get and they are not scalable. So there are other sources um, for example, crowdsourcing and uh, remote sensing data. All right. Thanks, Hao Jing, for the answer or responding to this question. Uh, we are uh, we are running out of time, but here let's show an, uh, the last question here, uh, which I guess this is towards to uh, Joa. Uh, very nice talk. You mentioned the needs of diverse communities and gave examples. Uh, what strikes me as interesting in your and similar presentations is that our views about the needs of these diverse communities are pretty uh, canonical. And there is a second part here. Um, we tend to create rather uniform classes and the inferences on top of them. Isn't that the opposite of what we are really after as a society? Um, it's a very good question. I agree that the needs of these groups uh, have been ignored in most of time and they're marginalized. Uh, but I don't see that uh, making uh, urban places uh, more diverse and in order to include them uh, is a way to make the society uniform. Uh, I think that uh, adding more diverse features into the uh, urban places that can make those urban places accessible for all of them. And uh, they, for example, uh, I can discuss an example here. For example, we can use some uh, symbolic features. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, using the symbolic features, we can uh, be their voice and we can uh, acknowledge, that, acknowledge that, uh, although they are marginalized, they always have been here. So I think this is a way to make more diverse uh, urban places. And these uh, features are not going to support just specific groups, but it can uh, support uh, all of the people because, uh, Again, I can discuss an example here. For example, I talked about integrated pavement. And integrated pavements not only uh, support people with movement disabilities, uh, it can support different urban events, uh, social events in the urban places. I mean, uh, an urban place with lower, uh, with a the uh, minimum ups and downs can support different social events. So I think this is a way uh, to include all the people in the urban places uh, rather than marginalizing them more. Great, thanks a lot, Hao Jin. Uh, there are more uh, questions and the comments from the QA session. I hope uh, you can all stay around a little bit longer and check these questions, but we won't deal with them here in our joint session here because we are running out of time, obviously. Um, finally, uh, thank you all again for our fantastic presenters here from all places around the world. Thank you for waking up so early to participate in this session. Uh, thanks a lot. And for the next, uh, in, the, in this afternoon, we are going to have more sessions and a keynote speaks. Um, we are looking forward to seeing you there as well. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>